Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is the Econfim webinar series at ASEC Business School, and I am Andrea Roncoroni, director of the center. Today, we have uh, Macbo Dada presenting uh, a paper on agricultural supply chain. Mac is a professor in operations management and business analytics at the John Hopkins Carey Business School. And he got a PhD in operations management from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research focuses on operations management, healthcare operations, supply chain management, and pricing models. Mac extensively published on top academic journals, including management science, practical radiation oncology, anesthesiology, manufacturing and assist, service operations management, operations research, and marketing science. He has served as associate editor for decision sciences, management science, and manufacturing and service operations management, and currently serves for production and operations management. Today, he is presenting a paper, as I was saying, on agricultural supply chains in emerging markets competition and cooperation under correlated yields. Thanks for joining us, Mac, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very uh, honored to have been invited to give this talk. Um, of course, I, I've been fortunate enough to know Andrea for the last four or five years, I think. And, you know, um, uh, I also see one or two familiar faces. Rodanko is joined and my co-author Jian Li, who actually did most of this work, is also joining in. So I want to uh, tell you briefly that, you know, how this talk kind of evolved. So once a year at Washington University, uh, the Boeing Center organizes a, a conference annually for a interface of finance and operations. So this sort of was born out of that conference. So I find this topic interesting. It's a little different than what I have done in the past, but it at, it, at its heart, it's really a inventory problem. At least that's the way I th thought of it. So I will try and explain to you what the problem is like and why it's interesting. Um, gener generically, so I can start with how it motivated me to start with this paper. So um, in this paper, we are going to talk about um, how pricing and yield intersect in the agricultural setting. So this is true. Uh, in this paper, uh, this paper is kind of took many years to build, so it's kind of long. And we are not going to be covering everything. I'm going to speak for about hoping to, I've planned it for a 45 minute talk, but you may feel free to interrupt me anytime. And I think that this will, uh, I like, uh, I have no problems stopping to answer questions. So let me show you, what how this paper was born. So it kind of grew out of the cotton sector in Mozambique. So I just put this picture here because I myself used to get confused sometimes about where Mozambique was. Um, but it's a you know a typical country if you want in South Af in Africa. Um, so Cotton was used in Africa, just not in Africa, but in many parts of the world as a cash crop to promote emerging markets. So within Mozambique, cotton is kind of designed to serve uh, the growth of export-oriented farming. So three, it, it's a, it has a significant part of the economy, the agricultural economy. And like Many uh, uh, projects of this nature, development projects of this nature, uh, typically 
there is an intermediate processing and to, to make sure that the technological capital utilization of technology is hard enough, it's typical to design or divide the country into regions. And, and then it's like a grouping of a collection of farmers with a, in, the, in our context, a ginner, but you can think of it as an intermediate processor. And even, even in the, uh, in, even in a, uh, just not in emerging markets, but generally in agriculture policy, to make sure that some risk bearing is by farmers is protected, there's typically some sort of minimum pricing scheme, which we will see plays some role in the modeling. So this is how this happened. Um, the development of the agricultural industry happened kind of in two waves. The green wave was the first wave and it was as would be, you would expect if it was going to be successful, it is it's likely to be successful first in the first wave. And then it then in, there was a second wave which didn't go as well. Perhaps they overextended their reach. So there were problems. Failures of the intermediate processes, the ginners in our context, farmers feeling pressure then to sell outside the region, all sorts of things happen. So the World Bank, which finances many of these things, kind of was worried, and they are going to uh, drive our modeling. So as I said, we have a minimum price. It uh, set way before the yields are known. And farmers, as I mentioned, sometimes get tempted to play off ginners against each other and they go outside their uh, concession or franchise to sell to other intermediaries who may, fee, may be facing underutilized uh, resource, uh, underutilization of the capacity. So this is the basic setting. So this is that's important to us because it, in Mozambique itself, somehow this experiment, if you want to call this, was not working. So here's a quote that Panos found from the One World Bank report a few years ago. And I think you could put any industry in a, any country, which is in a sort of form of the emerging market and something like this would be true. That there's a mismatch in the way the technology is being managed and their market failures. So this is what got us interested in this problem. But the way, once we studied the problem, this issue shows up in many, many agricultural industries. So we can abstract from it a little bit. And instead of just focusing on farmers and raising cotton and ginners, we can just think of a, a crop and an intermediate processor, okay? So we are interested in these types of questions. The questions kind of evolved in parallel and sometimes they preceded the analysis. Sometimes they came as we made progress in the modeling. So the question is how much of a relationship there should be between the intermediary and the, and the farmer and how much uh, decentralization or centralization should they should be. So that's what this is trying to say. And as is true in almost every economic sort of agricultural polit political economy, the question is, how do you balance providing a minimum price which is sufficiently high without taking incentives away from the processors because ultimately they have to pay a higher price. So we did not know the answer to this question. You know, I grew up in Pakistan and we have a cotton industry. And I knew many family, many students in my class, in my school, whose families own ginning mills. So I kind of heard about this quite a bit like just in everyday conversation. 
So I assume that this type of structure where you have franchises is the standard way to go, but you will see sometimes it's better not to do this, um, at least from our model. So I will try and explain this to you, you as we go along. So what we found was we wanted to see how to set the minimum price guarantee and whether having intermediation, like having vertical integration, horizontal integration has an impact. And since it's, we, are, we have an operation background rather than an econ or finance background, it's natural for people like me to think about the planning problem at an operational level. So how much should the farmer invest in this crop relative to some traditional subsistence farming they were doing? And one thing I learned from years and years of attending this annual conference is that the agricultural business is more sensitive than I ever imagined. What I mean by that is that yield losses uh, vary tremendously from region to region. And even small changes in the amount of rainfall can have bad outcomes or good outcomes. So it's important to understand how much correlation of yields through uh, uncontrollable factors affects um, what we are, or how, how the farmer should make their decisions. I won't be able to do as much about, uh, discuss as much about the yield correlation aspect except towards the end of the talk. But it's very interesting. And it still remains, even though we made lots of progress, there's still challenges that remain in the modeling. So we built a simple model that we abstracted from this area to capture all these features. And I'd like to now explain this model to you guys, because I think it's a it's an easy to understand model and, and we were happy that we found it and that we could explain so many of the results that we wanted to capture. So we have a system where there are two regions or two concessions. And the goal is for the farmer to, the, the way this works is the government sets a price. Each farming region decides how much to invest in, in that crop. There is a yield that is realized. And after the yield is realized, we would know how much was produced and there may or may not be mismatches between supply and capacity. So sometimes the supply may exceed capacity and other times that is the other way. And the, uh, and the amount of leverage each party has depends on their own production and the, and the relative yields. So this structure is captured here. So then the farmers and the processors kind of have to negotiate a contract. There's a formal contract which is in which it's expected that farmer, the region, the farmers from region one would sell to the process to processor one, and farmers from region two would sell to processors in the processor in region two. But there is some planned and uh, or informal or informal crossover of supply from farmers to other regions. Then the processors finish, for example, in cotton, they would they would make, they would create, you know, they would gin it, and then the lint would be exported in an international market. So for the most part, though we can relax this assumption, we we kind of assume that the economy is small compared to the global market. And therefore, um, the, the country as a whole, the export market from Mozambique, in our example, would be small enough that they have limited impact on the global price of the crop. It's not a critical assumption, but it makes the analysis easier to do. And we have been able to relax it to some degree, in fact, quite, quite easily. 
sufficiently, I should say. So this is a simple model. And if, you know, when you teach a course in business analytics or operations research or management science or even transportation, this type of network is a transportation network and a very simple transportation network because you know the capacities act as like demand and the farmers uh, yield the crop access supply. And so this is just a transportation model with some competition and economics built in. So it's easy to characterize. So we were able to do this here. And that drives our model. There is a huge literature in, in operations management on agriculture. Um, historically, so these two papers are good surveys of uh, of the of the field. So my previous job before I moved to Hopkins, I used to be at uh, 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 Purdue University, and Tim Lau wrote this paper in part because he 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 was used to be there, and by I think I took his spot. He left to move to Iowa and I took over. There was a there was a position and they hired me. And this gentleman, Preckle, who I kind of only knew to say hi, lived across the street from me for many years. Or oh, I lived across the street from him. Um, it's a small world in the end. And uh, this paper is out of New Zealand, this review paper. But it's still very interesting because agriculture is big in New Zealand as we all know. So it's interesting. And for somebody like me who studied yields for a long time, it was kind of nice to write a paper on agriculture because the very first paper is by Carlin. And the motivating example is exactly this problem, that there's a farmer, they decide how much, to, how much crop to plant, and then they have a multiplicative yield, which is kind of nice to have that is sort of a historical connection to, to what we knew, okay? So the literature on uh, uh, much of this literature, which is related to what we will do, has this idea of a stochastic program with recourse. So there is like typically a two-stage program. You do something in the first stage, there's a correction in the second stage. And that's what all these papers tend to do. Um, they, they're different than what we have done. These, these don't seem to have competition directly in them. And often the focus is on uh, designing a contract between the two parties. So there's, so it's not multilateral like our model, generally, this type of work. I know that's a very broad claim to make, but it's generally fair to say that. Um, that's what the point here I wanted to make. The, there is a closer literature, which I think is uh, more related to strategic questions that arise in planning for operations. So this paper by Ahn, if you guys are familiar, this is a paper in which Chris Tang, who's at UCLA, is an author. And it has, it's a very simple idea, but it's very sophisticated in trying to put together a framework on, on explaining how farmers can band together to compete. So we learned a lot from this paper. And this paper by Xi'an and Olson, so Olson is the, also had the review paper on the previous slides, the STAWA, and this, is, this paper deals with the cooperative uh, structure in farming. I think it's modeled after some, some uh, co-op in, uh, in New Zealand after uh, Tawa moved there from the US. She's from New Zealand originally, and I ran into her at our INFORMS conference, and now she's in Australia. So I uh, just thought I'd tell you how much uh, dynamics they are. And uh, 
what we are trying to do is focus on the interaction between co-op co structure and intermediate processes, which I think has not been addressed by these types of papers. So we are almost close to the heart of the model. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of work on government interactions and the same two or three people show up all the time. Um, but let me get on to with this and let me remind you then of our paper of the model. Government set some pricing rule. Farmers react by choosing how much to invest. They see a yield. Then they do trading after the harvest is collected. Processors may compete directly or indirectly with each other. And then the product is sold in the open market. So it's a two-stage game. So two regions. It's, we had a little bit of trouble convincing our reviewers that this was OK to do. So we have a small, we have a whole bunch of our idea is a small bunch, there are many, many small farmers in each region. And these farmers have similar characteristics that we can sort of pool them. It's a little harder than we expected to make, make it work. So that's what we did. So then by doing this way, we have an aggregate farmer. So the representation of the decision making becomes easier. And as I mentioned, we have two processes. Each of them has some capacity, which is one of the two ways the technology is characterized. The other way the technology is characterized is that the processing costs are different. And this is without kind of any loss of generality that we just arbitrarily made processor one cheaper per unit cost. This allows us in some of the analysis to say that since the, the, cheap, the, the cheaper processor is more efficient, so we break ties in the favor of the cheaper processor, though most of our results, if not all of them, go through if we didn't make that assumption. And as I mentioned, there's the global market, the price is kind of exposed, so we are price takers. And there's a local market, which is an alternative outside option for the farmers. And we are trying to induce them to give that up and invest in this export crop for which they get some price guarantee. And we didn't make any, we have the simplest type of model. We are risk neutral, expected profit maximization and full information. We are almost there. So this is the this is the timeline. It's important to understand our timeline. What we are going to do is we are in, we are mostly going to treat the price as exogenous. It's a policy decision that the firm makes, and then we'll show you that using kind of comparative statics, but not quite. That this is sort of doesn't. It's almost immaterial how this is set. As I mentioned, farmers react by choosing the, the allocations. Yields are realized and all uncertainty is resolved here. And then it's a deterministic game between the four parties. Sort of regulated by the government. So this is, as I mentioned, this is, you can think of this problem as a being like a transportation problem. So it's solution because it's a two by two matrix, you can kind of write it down like this. So it's easy to use, just minimums of linear functions. So we can kind of do this. It makes the analysis look very nice and clean. This is a key breakthrough. And I think this is the closest link we have to the econ literature. So think of these, think of these form, these um, processes. They may have first, first right 
of the, they may have first dibs on their own farmer, but imagine the supply is limited. Then you want to be able to maximize profits by trying to steal some of this crop. And so you may sell, you may, you may, you may uh, try and buy, induce the farmers to sell to you by uh, setting a price, purchase price higher than the minimum price, P0. And if you do it like this, it's like an agricultural market. I think of this like the tulip market in, uh, in, 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 in the Netherlands. And, but it's really like a Bertrand competition in reverse. And you can think of this as willingness to pay. So how this is this is very standard for economists. This is a very simple equation for people like me. It was it took a little work to find, but it's simple after the fact. So this is basically the idea. If you if if you want what's the the highest price you'll be willing to pay per unit is to think of it this way, you bid the price, and if you lose the auction, you will get, you know, if and as long as the your rival doesn't take all the supply, you will get everything that's left over, and you will just have to pay the minimum price for it. Since you're paying the minimum price for it, what will happen is you can now ask yourself that if I win the auction, I want to not set, I want to set the price as high as possible to win the auction, but not higher than what I would make if I lose the auction. So this is basically a simple uh, equation, which looks, once you simplify, once you sort of rearrange terms, gives you these uh, expressions for willingness to pay. The key point here is that it only depends on its own price. It does not depend. This, this, these equations are independent, like an almost all willingness to pay models, independent of your rival's economic parameters. So that's an insight that we take advantage of, and this helps us solve the entire problem, because it sort of creates a clarity in how the equilibrium prices would arise and what the allocations would do. But it's still quite complicated. And in the end, we are able to figure out who's going to win, who's going to win the, who's going to win the, pro, the, the competition, and what the equilibrium prices will end up being. I think that's what we mean by final prices. Okay. And as you would expect, is second best. So the winner pays the rival's price, and the the rival the loser pays the minimum price. So it's simple to explain. Despite the second stage problem being relatively straightforward because it's a deterministic problem, the farmer stage one problem is quite nonlinear. These functions are quite difficult. Um, they have nonlinearities built in because of the mins and maxes that are expressed. So even though I'm saying it's easy to write, the unraveling it was a little bit of work. And it it's kind of a combinatorial uh, equilibrium that we use to get the answer. So before I do this, this is sort of the broad brush of our results. We looked at two. We looked at uh, three sort of generic cases. We did all or nothing yields. That means it's Bernoulli. That's just because in yield in the yield literature, it everybody starts that way. And you, uh, I'll try and persuade you that once we understand this structure, we are able to generalize it to. Uh, uh, other types of yield distributions, which I'll talk about at the end. But for this problem, we'll mostly focus on the independent case where there are like two, two Bernoulli yields. And 
the results and the technology is such that you could do, you can do these. And these are also interesting in their own right. And they give rather unexpected results. But that's a, you can read the paper to find those. And we looked at different type of structures. So most of the analysis that I'm going to share with you deals with a decentralized structure. So the parties are independent, but they are alternative structures. The two farmers could act as a co-op and then they would give them some marketing power over the genus or the processes. Alternatively, the processes can also act as a co-op. Then you have vertical, you know, and they will essentially pay P0 to you because they have all full control over the prices. A more traditional uh, model, like from people who study marketing channels, would be to do vertical integration. So the farmer and the processor in one region work together against the farmer and processor in the other region. And just as a benchmark, uh, we use the centralized planning to, to show our, how our results change. Because in a planned economy, you can easily think of a centralized structure. So it, in a way, the centralized structure is first best. And our decentralized structure is not first best. And the question is, how close can we come to the first best equilibrium in this problem? Um, we did quite well. So the way this problem worked is, because everything is linear in the allocations, we were able to divide the admissible region for all solutions into these 12 polygons. So it's just a coincidence that they are triangles. And some of them are not because the ones here just go on forever. But the amazing thing that happened is once you do all the counting, there are dozens and dozens of cases that you rule out. Basically, if in when we characterize the Nash equilibria, we can show that the Nash equilibria are on the boundaries. So the interior doesn't matter. And if so, so we kind of know where the equilibriums are going to be. And then it can happen that there is a continuum of equilibria uh, in a very special contingency in this problem. And if there is an equilibrium of, if there's a continuum, it's going to be on one of these diagonal lines. So we are able to like, the way we solve this problem is we go through and figure out all the cases and then we can integrate them together into a clean structure. Okay. And so this type of, so it's like I, there is, an, there is a literature in game theory which looks at combinatorics game theory, which I don't know well, if hardly. But I think it's, it may have been done by somebody else, but we didn't find it. This type of idea. So this is just to show that we can, how the Nash equilibria are, are characterized. That's not as important to us, but that was just my way of telling you guys that there's some math in here for people who you know are like me and somehow think if you do some, some math, it makes your paper superior, even though that's not true. So I have to write a paper with that equations and then I won't be able to say this. But it has a clean interpretation. And I'll try and explain this to you guys. So this characterizes the entire decision space. And notice that the we we since we are treating the out the minimum price as an exogenous, we are able to characterize the equilibrium across all possible values. And this is just sort of the margin. So the PE is the outside, is the price in the outside market. And C is like the 
in the symmetric case is the manufacturers or the processors unit cost. So this is like the margin for the economy. And notice that we have it in different colors. And we it has some interpretation that I would like to share with you. Um, in this area, which says no production, there is the is is the the it is not in our interest for the farmers to plant anything. In this area, we have what in this is full production, but we are especially in, important for us to focus on the blue and gold areas. So in this area, the farmers try to match the capacity of the processor. And in this area, the profits are so high that both farmers get greedy and they try and produce more than the own, more than the own uh, processor's capacity. So you end up with an oversupply. So the reason the blue and gold are important is because the first best solution is always in these two zones in a centralized solution. So the centralized solution lies here. And you can see that in this picture, we can show that you can set the price to map it. Okay. So this is sort of an informal way of showing that we can achieve first best by choosing the P0 appropriately. And then that's, I explained this to you already that there's a mapping between no production and other things. And this works best in the all or nothing case. It also works for other, the approximation is less, is less, less perfect for, the, the interpretation is less perfect for other yield distributions. But the idea still holds, and I'll get to it at the end. I'm keeping track of time. We are in good shape. Um, so we also look at different ownership structures, as I mentioned. And roughly speaking, the way this is organized for the same parameter set, D stands for decentralized. FC is farmers co-op, processors co-op, the vertically integrated channels competition and the centralized solution. So this is, the, as in roughly speaking, prices go up if you go this way. But the important thing to see is that the price, that the, as I mentioned, the centralized solution, which is first best, is either to do overproduction or to do full production. It just is. But more importantly, you can always choose a price such that you achieve first best by in all of these five structures. So that's very unusual in sort of contracting literature and operations that you can show that ownership structure doesn't matter in achieving first best. So we were lucky to find this result. And uh, and it really made us very excited because it I th we think it comes from the fact that everything is linear and on the boundaries of that picture I showed you, the geometric interpretation. So this is just a technical condition which we don't really, it doesn't come in the way. So this is important to us that we can achieve first best in a decentralized setting. So in the, in the operations, contracting world, that's kind of considered a good result. So we were able to show this to you, that we can induce first best policies, independent of the ownership structure. So that's a nice result. Because what have I shown you so far, that the minimum price doesn't matter, matter in the sense that ownership and is not affected by this. I, I think I also kind of uh, uh, implied that we we could have optimal solutions or equilibria in which 
sometimes even in the first best solutions here, especially with overproduction, sometimes it's in our interest to have crops from one region shipped to the processor in the other region. So even though development bankers might think it's not good for the economy, it in our modeling, it seems like it's something that should be allowed at least in some regulated way. So that's our takeaway, really. That is kind of contrary to conventional wisdom. So I mentioned this already. Uh, and then this is just true. We did elaborate amounts of analysis. You know, each, uh, papers like these in my type of journals uh, require infinite amounts of work. So I pretty much, I finished the paper's broad view picture. And now what is left is, I just want to talk about a little bit about the robustness in terms of the yield assumption we made. So the geometry that we discovered helps us solve the problem when yield is from a continuous, is, is a continuous rep, random variable. So as I mentioned in Carlin's model, the yield is proportional between some number say between zero and one. So if you if you planted X and the yield was Y, your output will be X times Y. So this is just, we are able to do a little bit, quite a bit with this problem. So this is just an example of how by solving this problem region by region in the polygon by polygon in this uh, in that uh, uh, picture I showed, we can we can paste and build this solution. So the green line is a centralized solution. So it's independent of the price because the government owns everything. And you can see that this blue line is the total amount that we will plant. And if you make the price too high, it can exceed what you would want as a, as a centralized planner. And this is just as an analog, same mean and everything. This is what happens in our uh, all or nothing case. So, there's quite a bit more production because the yields are not discrete. And you can see how the, the farmer one in our model is the more efficient farmer, a more efficient uh, channel. But look, you can see that being the, the not being, if you are, if you are not cheap, if you're second most expensive, you can still come out ahead. So that's a, that just from the mod, from the way we met, uh, the assumptions we made about the stochastic proportional yield. But this problem is kind of intractable. Here's an example to, to show you how we do further, how, what we get in terms of profits, but let me get to the, since we are reaching our end, um, uh, this is where we got. So what we did is, in general, when you have correlated, when you have a stochastic correlated yield, the problem is kind of difficult. But it has very elegant structure when you assume perfect correlation. And this result is quite general. And what we were able to do is reduce the problem to just one variable. Um, and this is, this is the, uh, these are the reaction functions for the two farmers. Notice how they're not well behaved. Look, this goes up, down has a kink. And of course, this is a mirror image. So it's not regular. You know how when we do read a textbook on uh, game theory, we want downward sloping response functions or concave or, or uh, have super or submodularity. None of that's going to happen here. And you can see that, that you can find the equilibrium because we can reduce the problem to a search in one variable. 
So it's like a fixed point, but you can see we never found a fixed point more than one fixed point. So it looks like numerically that we always get a, just one equilibrium in the interior, but there's no way to know because look at how poorly behaved these functions are. Okay, But still, it gave us some insight and we were able to do all that numerical work I just shared with you. So this is how we solved the paper. So, as I explained, I've already explained these results. And what I'd like to do is sort of summarize what we have done. So we, our motivation was to understand whether we could prevent this leakage of production or harvest from one region to another. In the process, we discovered that it can be best, first, even in the centralized solution, some leakage can be good. Um, and as I mentioned more than once, we can achieve first best with a decentralized solution, which is an interesting result. Um, much of our analysis dealt with this canonical, if you want, of standard case of all or nothing yields just to get insight. We were able to do the IID case. And as I said, we can, we can analytically also solve a perfectly positively correlated one and a perfectly negatively correlated one case. And since we can do pro stochastic proportional yields, numerically, we can solve other variations of the all or nothing case. For our experiments in the, in the proportional yield case, we just focused on the uniform distribution because numerically it's hard work to do this and it achieved what we wanted to show that it's not as well behaved as we would like. So, that's what we did in the last few pictures I showed you, how to deal with uh, uh, proportional, uh, pro proportionally correlated yields. And I gave some results for the perfectly, perfectly proportional correlated case. And one approach we also examined was that if you wanted to limit these cross-region flows, you can take our results put like an excise tax on transfers and we can generate um, and we could we can generate virtually all the results we have that are presented for such a model. So you can limit uh, cross border flow, cross cross regional flows in the model if you wanted to, but it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a dead loss to the economy because you're taking money out of the uh, out of the network and even when we put back all the money it somehow doesn't give you back the same solutions so you end up with inferior solutions in some sense so we started by trying to get rid of these leakages and we discovered that the leakages are helpful if controlled and that the results work for a wide range of uh, 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 ownership structures and yield structures. And importantly, how the minimum price is set, some, this has an interaction with the ownership structure, but in all cases, we can get to first best. So I think the, the, this is the 80 or 90% of the results we have. The rest of them are like to show the scope of the model. So thank you for your time. I think I ran over by about five minutes. Okay. And I'll be happy to answer any questions we may have. Thank you, Mac. Any shall questions? I stop, shall I stop sharing or? Oh, no, but you can leave in case okay. you want to go over the presentation. Okay. So is there any question? I have one. Actually, uh, you were talking about uh, the IID cases with uniform distribution yeah. as a case where you, you managed to do <coughs> the calculations. Now, if the yields are uniformly distributed, you might assign a, a dependent structure through copula functions. So might this be a way to facilitate the calculations that otherwise would be difficult or they still be untractable in your opinion? So 
your question is very reasonable. What happened is, I can show you, we did do it. I just didn't present the, the result. I, I can explain it to you. So the way we can solve this for, say we did this for IID yields and perfectly positively correlated stochastic yields and negatively correlated ones. And what happens is we did it region by region. And, and what happens is that the solution is no longer on, on the boundaries. The solution is in the interior, but we are able to sort of draw it and we can find the solutions. So what we did is we, we in the paper, in one of the appendices in the paper or the online version of the paper or whatever, the pictures, we show what it looks like. So it's like a continuum, even if there's, it's like the solution kind of ends up here mostly. It's like a line based on the sensitivity and, and we are able to use this result as a building block to solve the problem for any stochastic proportional yield problem. And you're right that the equations help us simplify the analysis, but still there's no guarantee, right? We can just do it numerically, but I can't tell you if it's unique. Here I can say something. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Any other question among the participants? Some of them are students in our school and they just started their master in finance. So yeah. uh, it was a... Well, I, yeah, I appreciate the time. They yeah. don't have to join, right? So I appreciate it. Okay, then. Okay, thank you very much, Mac. And uh, right. thanks to all the participants. Uh, the next webinar will take place on November 21st. And uh, we will welcome uh, uh, on board uh, Alex Young from the London Business School on capacity expansion in service platforms, ownership, commitment, and flexibility. Thank you again, Mac, for joining us today. And yeah. uh, I recall to all the participants that uh, these slides, as well as the video presentation, will be made available in a couple of weeks on our website. Thanks again, and uh, have a nice uh, you know, afternoon, evening, uh, depending where you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye.